welcome to yet another episode of Sustainable Living with Chilpa Reddy, powered by Planet Green, Farm Natura, a new beginning to your life. Today, on another episode of Home Crop Explore with Chilpa, I'm here to show you all one of the most beautiful farms in Hyderabad, uh, which is owned by Ravi and Kavita Manta. Uh, to be honest, I want to share a secret. Uh, I've been on this farm much before I even started my organic farming. In fact, I came to see how it's all done and I was so impressed and I was so motivated to start my own farm. So I wanted to show this to you all, my lovely viewers. Wait and watch what we are going to explore. We have with us Ravi and Kavita Manta. I've known them for many years. Amazing couple who are into sustainable practices. I would probably like to call them conscious couple. Hi Ravi. Hi, Hi Kavita. Hi, Hi Shilpa. Shilpa. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure is mine. And I also wanted to tell you all that this is the farm they started and did everything from the scratch. And I want them to explain you all what wonderful job they did with this piece of property. <laughs> Let's uh, begin from your farm. <laughs> so I mean um, ideas like this like you said consciousness um, this is actually was a unconsciously conscious effort. I remember when Ravi and I started dating in 1998 he told me he wanted to come back to India and become a farmer. <laughs> so I really had no leg to stand on when in 2014 he said you know the time is now and uh, we're gonna go back and do this. So in a long way I think the journey was always part of uh, you know it, this whole thing is just a manifestation of an idea that he's had for a very long time um, and then everything from there on naturally organically just grew from a place where you know we had young kids we wanted to make sure we were sustainable in terms of what we were providing uh, we lived in Singapore for a long time where obviously everything comes from outside you know Correct. hardly anything is produced so to go from that culture to a culture where we were able to sustain our families needs uh, was sort of the driving force that got us uh, started mm -hmm. back in uh, 2014. Yeah, we were very lucky, I mean we literally came back in 2014 and, and bought this piece of land here and uh, it was a village road at the time, it's a single lane and uh, now it's much closer to the city because of the, the, the road, the new road. Right. Uh, and uh, it was just completely barren, uh, not even a, a fence around it mm. and uh, we started literally from scratch. Uh, 2016 is when we really got going. So right. Typically, a, a sustainable farm is a 10-year project, so we're 4 out of 10, I would say, at the moment, 4 years out of 10. Okay. So every year, we keep adding more elements. Mm. Um, and uh, the whole point is authenticity. So we're soil farmers, we, we make soil. Mm. And then what we get out of it is the surplus, uh, the food that, that comes out. So we actually uh, take coffee grounds from the city, from a couple of big coffee shops. So our trucks go in with vegetables, they come back with coffee grounds. Okay. And we compost them here. Composting is a big part of, uh, of sage and, uh, and baby elephant farm. And the principles behind the farm are, it's called baby elephant farm actually because my second book on, uh, it's on nutrition, is called the baby elephant diet. Okay. And it's implementing the, the principles of nutrition from that book, which is uh, healthy food, local food and uh, lots of fiber. Uh, and, a, and a, a huge variety. So we have more, over 50 different types of vegetables that are grown here, uh, plus fruit. And then we have our own animals, uh, our chickens and eggs, and, uh, and our, our goats come from, uh, from here as well. Yes. So everything we're doing is, uh, is, to, uh, is not just you know, living our own you know, life in a sustainable way, but also trying to, uh, to share that experience with, uh, with, with, with the city as Wonderful. well. And I'm sure it's, it wasn't easy, you know, it, I know what it takes to develop just a small piece of land. And how many acres is this now? It's 70. 70. And then we have another 20 further down the road. So. Wonderful. I want, to see, yeah. I want to know how it all started, meaning the kind of uh, hard work you had to put in to make it look like this today. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, bit by bit really, uh, a lot of the farming effort is um, you know, understanding what the soil can produce, uh, what is actually, as Ravi mentioned, our business is really to make sure that the soil is enriched and um, uh, everything that comes out of that is a benefit to us. But understanding that soil, making sure that that soil is being nurtured, uh, filling in the gaps for whatever is required to make sure that you're getting a wholesome meal. Um, a lot of people ask us, uh, you know, 
is this really a sustainable way to go mm. and really for us the answer is we don't take care of the soil then you know <laughs> what else could possibly be sustainable right. mm. so uh, we started off with one little patch across the uh, farm trying to just grow brinjal and what we realized was that the whole idea of permaculture was one but also the whole idea of growing with native seeds and really not worrying about the yield but focusing more on just enriching your produce mm. the flavors that we were getting out of our vegetables were just things that people were able to recognize and differentiate absolutely absolutely and uh, <laughs> that's really what got us going from doing you know a small uh, you know small little patch to what is now about um, about 8 to 10 acres of the farm are now being uh, cultivated for all kinds of things So every uh, venture like this, I guess, starts really small. So I'll take you now to where this journey really began for us, in a very, very small way that we were able to uh, start growing vegetables and really understand the difference that we could bring into people's lives. Sure, let's go. Right. So one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to hmm. is uh, the greens um, they are often uh, very susceptible to transfer right um, so we have a cold truck that comes here every wednesday and saturday morning hmm. during a uh, that's when we have the weekly markets at sage right um, and so the leaves are plucked fresh in the morning and then sent from there so even though we work with a whole lot of other farmers and we encourage them to um, engage in farming as well greens are the one thing that we find that you know the longer they spend in transit the more poorly they are transferred uh, the right. lower the chance of them losing their nutrition value which sort of takes away from everything so we have everything from beautiful palak to gongura gongura methi kutni uh, mint um uh, totukura I but can't <laughs> resist uh, <laughs> coriander <laughs> yeah. i mean that's really the best part i mean this is really the try the gongura why. we started farming so you should be able to come here you know yeah, shilpa try the gongura right off the really plant nice and uh, pop it in your mouth this wow oh my god I yeah yeah more, have more than <laughs> <laughs> exactly this you can That's literally nice tangy yeah taste oh. and this really mm-hmm. was the inspiration for a lot of the food at sage as well i mean oh. this so when you think of a salad <laughs> we only think about kale right and, you know, broccoli <laughs> and lettuce and things like that and Those are not local greens. They hardly <laughs> have the depth of flavor that gongura that just True. popped in your mouth with that, you know, energy. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Um, it's, it's so fantastic in a salad. It's a little uh, ironic, actually, because you know I'm a Telugu and uh, Kavita is a Tamilian, and uh, in in the early years of our marriage, when we would source gongura in in the U.S., oh. and it's not a a, a leaf that that uh, that you know that they're familiar with in tamil nadu right. right it's it's very much a telugu thing so i would i would okay. boast that this is the best leaf ever and it's a telugu thing and okay. <laughs> we had this healthy you know like a rivalry about it right. and now it's become mm-hmm. like the mainstay of our farm is uh, is and, and the cafe as well yep. it's such a healthy leaf gongura another disappearing <laughs> bead of uh, bead of insects ah okay <laughs> 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 But this leaf is so <laughs> yum. Yeah. So I mean, that's been definitely one of our, um, you know, this is what inspires food. Um, just being able to see it here, um, realizing that the demand is so um, constant compared to the seasonality of the foods. Mm-hmm. That's really how a lot of our food journey began, which is what got us deeper into farming. Okay. Uh, because it was a very strong recognition that seasonal vegetables were not being consumed the way mm. they were growing okay uh, most families land up eating almost the same menu week on mm. week right. all through the year correct um, and it's the it's the kind of lifestyle we really lead, lead right now mm-hmm. it's easy to have one set menu <laughs> right. and you know have you know help your maids you know understand how to cook that and then continually right. get the same things but when produce is in abundance you know uh, two months back we had no greens everything was getting washed out with every rain, rain that came exactly back. Huh. and now we have this lush beautiful <laughs> green and if <laughs> there are no takers for it then that's a really sad, sad. sad moment so correct uh, the whole food philosophy with sage was that let's we don't procure anything mm. externally mm. we don't have any set recipes for any of our uh, that's the uh, beauty <laughs> uh, any of our dishes whatever is in the pantry whatever is available whatever hasn't sold out 
that's really what we land up using and uh, making. And in fact, today for the first time, my mother tasted a uh, uh, potlakai salad. And oh. she said, how can you put potlakai, <laughs> raw potlakai in a salad? I just waited five minutes until she tasted it. Mm. And I know she's going to be making that recipe for <laughs> you soon. So. I tasted potlakai in yeah. Asia. Snake, ah, right. snake gold, yeah. yeah. Right. We'll go visit all the other animals now. Oh, <laughs> now that you met Oreo and Kia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've got micro beans here. We've got uh, wheat grass growing in here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually chana. Chana, okay. Yeah, it's fantastic to extreme nutrition. So, uh, this is sort of our experimenting bit where we do a lot of this. And, uh, some of these actually get uh, dried in our solar dryer okay. and then we powder them mm. and that way they have a much longer shelf life right. and are extremely nutritional because so solar drying actually maintains the nutritional value of Correct. the leaves really well. So, so solar dry them and then powder them and use them later yeah. on? And then you can just add it into your smoothies and Correct. stuff like that. It's a great way to add okay. some extra protein and nutrition without uh, mm. changing the flavor too much. Layers. Okay. Most of our chicken have a healthier mm. diet than a lot of uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the excess from the farm comes to them. So you know the oh. reason they grab your coriander is because they're used to actually eating uh, a lot of that. So we make and sure without that pesticide <laughs> or all that. Absolutely. You guys have a sensitivity to uh, to all of this food, right? Yeah. Uh, much more than uh, human beings do. See, so we've got a variety here. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, uh, that's Kadaknath right there with the, the black, black one. The black chickens, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some guinea hens as well, hiding somewhere. Okay. Uh, right there. Oh, okay. The guinea fowl, yeah. <laughs> so basically, you are what you eat and you are what you eat eats. Alright. Oh, so, so you have to, you know, you have to control the feed of your animals. Uh, in order to be healthy, especially nowadays with increased meat consumption. Right. And if you don't know what those animals are being fed, mm. uh, that's a serious problem because it shows up in your health Absolutely. down the line. So we right. take a lot of care in making sure our animals are fed literally the, pr pretty much what we would eat normally. <laughs> <laughs> Is five years five old. Years. Yeah. What's his name again? Minos. 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 Yeah. And the what a cool name you have, Minos. <laughs> entire litter here is uh, his progeny. Wow. So, so he's had a productive uh, four or five years that he's been on the farm here. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to see the lambs now, the little ones? Okay. Hui. Oh, see, the umbilical cord is still there. Yeah, so he's. Yesterday. Oh. This one is born yesterday, and if you see, the cord is still hanging from her belly button. <laughs> Gorgeous. So tiny, so tiny. So tiny. <laughs> oh, you're hungry? Okay, I'll put you down. <laughs> Look at the little uh, the line that she has. Wow, lovely pattern. And they are also very young. So these are just one day old. <laughs> and look at the gorgeous pattern they have on their backs. One la Okay. <laughs> 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 
composting is a huge aspect of what we do, which requires, you know, about an acre, acre and a half across the farm. Farm is actually dedicated just to composting. Wow. Uh, both Sage, uh, Sage Farm Cafe, as well as Baby Elephant Farm are actually uh, a zero waste uh, um, facilities where we don't have any municipal um, um, a municipal company coming in to take any waste. So I'm actually going to show you a little zero bit of waste. Fire. Zero mm -hmm. waste. Yeah. Wow. Uh, show show you a composting pit right around here. This is also where we do a lot of our composting. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, zero waste. Every paper and food waste from the cafe okay. um, comes out here. All the waste within the farm uh, comes out here. Uh, wow. We also work with Hyatt. Uh, we collect all of their uh, waste and we come here and we age it and we make compost with it. Wow. Uh, we work with uh, Roastery, get all of their coffee beans. Uh, those are again that incredible grounds. forms of uh, uh, carbon. All of that comes here and pits get made and each of them, although composting is taken at different levels, mm. um, at home it's great if you compost something and it's about a month old and you reuse it. Right. From a farm perspective, the more you age it, the more the nutrition value increases. So oh, okay. all these pits that you see all around are actually just compost that are aging and are turned over on a repeated basis to make sure that uh, moisture and that uh, nutritional composition of the compost actually mm -hmm. uh, improves. Wonderful. Um, so even the cafe's waste com comes here. Wow. Yeah. So the, even the cafe, even though it's in Jubilee Hill, we don't have any MCH uh, right. coming here. They're coming there. So we work with uh, a company that picks up all our dry waste. Okay. Uh, so obviously we are a zero waste company. We don't have any plastic on our premise. But whatever from a packaging perspective, anything that comes right. goes out as a dry waste. We work with uh, Chroma for our electronic waste. Everything else from the paper to the food. Uh, to the plates that we serve food on, uh, disposable plates, uh, which are compostable. Everything comes here and then gets uh, processed. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so impressive, Kavita, really. <laughs>a lot of dry hay, you've got a lot of the waste and then once all of that goes down then layers of jeevamrit and uh, medicine are put on top of it oh. so that the antibacterial properties of it uh, take over and then oh, every um, uh, the first three weeks we leave it untouched hmm. after the first three weeks it is then turned over on a weekly basis turned over meaning? Sure. Uh, you'll actually pick this up and, and you will literally turn it yeah, turn it okay. and then do the same process of adding the jeevamrut on top so that it covers it and protects it uh, a little bit. Um, after about uh, two months, we then cover it um, uh, with a tarp or something to just keep the moisture and let it grow. Okay. And anywhere between three to six months is when we actually take out and use a pile of uh, Oh, it takes that long, it is it? It takes that long, yeah. Wow, yeah. I so, didn't know that. Yeah, so I mean, the, the thing is, composting at any point in time, it will give you uh, more than what the soil has. Correct. So even if you're using two month old or right, three month old, right. it's perfectly fine. But the longer you keep it, the composition the just changes value. to yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah absolutely. So this no is wonder it's called uh, black gold. Black gold, <laughs> absolutely. Exactly, yeah. and we have a lot more on the hmm. other side. As we walk through the farm, I will uh, take you through okay. uh, all of that. Sure. So this is another. another this stage. is yeah, exactly. So th these are the early stages. Oh, and then they will start to get uh, uh, reduced and uh, uh, put down. I would think this is already ready, but I didn't know no, no, it no, was no, going no. to be so <laughs> Not long. at all. Oh. This is still very, very uh, early. It's early. Wow. So, Ravi, this is new. I don't think I saw this last time. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, this is Azola. So, on any farm, especially an organic farm, the challenge is to provide a healthy and balanced meal to the animals, to the chickens and to the cows. And Azola is a very fast growing uh, algae, it's a protein. It grows in a couple of days and fills the whole pond. And we can harvest that and uh, use it to, to feed the, the cows and then it replenishes itself just on, on water every, every couple of days, water and sunlight. So it's a, it's a very natural and very healthy form of protein for the animal feed. So even for chickens and goats? And for the cows, and cows, cows and chickens. They look beautiful. Well, they too. say that uh, algae and seaweed are going to save the world because you can grow all this protein at a very, very low cost and, and in a very sustainable way. Oh. It's better than animal protein. Wow.
But this is not edible for humans. Azolla is not edible for humans. Okay. Uh, but you know, lots of seaweed uh, is edible. Correct. Yeah. So Ravi, I saw a big uh, tank where <laughs> we, uh, you know, went to see the composting pits. Yeah. What's that? Well, that's where we do the uh, the fish waste composting. So we actually go to the local fish market okay. in the afternoon when they're done with all the cutting and all the you right. know, all their sales, and we take all the the waste material from the fish. Okay. And we bring it over here, and we make fish amino acid with it uh, wow. by composting it. It's really good for the plants, mm -hmm. and it's also great because the municipality loves us. They don't have to deal with this really smelly thing that they have to take to the dump yard. <laughs> right. So uh, if we can do more of that, I think uh, that'll be very useful for the for the community, where you know, okay. things that should that should be composted and reused mm -hmm. should be reused. You know that should. How be long uh, fish composting take? It's about four months, I think. Yeah, yeah. about four months. About yeah. four, months. four months. Four months for any. And it. Uh, yeah, and it comes out as this liquid gold, literally, you know, oh. the amino acid, and it's really good for the. You for spray the it on the plants. Yeah, yeah. you spray dilute it. Dilute it. Diluted. So it's diluted. Diluted. Yeah, so exactly. almost one is to ten dilution. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then it's a great way to uh, keep the pests away, but also nurture the plant. Okay. So okay. It has a lot of micronutrients and amino acids. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of. Uh, I mean, these days you have the you know other types of farming like hydroponics. Correct. Right, which is pretty much in a chemical nutrient solution. Right. So mm -hmm. you're missing out on a lot of the micronutrients that are from, from soil, soil and from natural amino acids. Right. So our product is a little different because we mm. you know, want to, uh, first of all, utilize the community's waste, mm. but at the same time turn it into, 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 into produce that is actually really healthy for you and that's natural. Yeah. It's like filth to wealth. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. see this beautiful banyan tree, the trunk is huge but then you see no branches. There's an interesting story behind this tree and I want Ravi to tell you guys what, what it took for this tree to come here and how she's thriving. When we bought this land it was completely barren so we wanted to put some uh, fully grown trees on it because uh, growing a tree takes 25 years. So we had gone to a few of the nurseries and we're looking at some of these exotic trees that are not native to Telangana that you know people are putting in their homes and stuff and we were not particularly impressed and then one evening we got a message on Facebook from the Tree Protection Society in Hyderabad uh, that said there's this uh, 100 year old banyan tree in this village square in Kartyal that is being chopped down because of a road widening and you know so much construction is happening our city is developing which is good news but the bad news is that all these beautiful trees that are native are being chopped down unnecessarily so we thought we would you know, do something about it and we actually sent a crane over to this village 90 kilometers away and we transplanted the whole great bunny and we had to remove a lot of the branches and stuff but the but the main trunk and we brought her here wow. and transplanted uh, and put it here two uh, two years ago and she's now growing leaves and, and survived and is thriving and the most amazing thing is that uh, a couple of months ago we discovered apis indica which is an indian honeybee which is a very picky customer because it doesn't come to uh, to places where there's any chemicals or pesticides, it's very sensitive. Uh, it's like the canary in the coal mine, you know, so it's a very sensitive honeybee. But we found that the honeybee has come onto the farm and not only that, they've made their nest, uh, their hive, the beehive inside the hollow of the, of the great banyan. So we're very, very pleased about that. <laughs> and 
I, I really would love to request people in Hyderabad you know, who want to put trees on their farm to look for uh, existing fully grown trees that are being perhaps chopped down in, in, uh, in construction and road widening projects rather than going for non-native species. So where are you taking me next, Kavita? So this was uh, one part of our sustainable journey and now we actually want to introduce you to our architecture and how the whole house and the farmhouse came out to be and what we're doing now with regards okay. to uh, farm stays uh, so people can enjoy this experience as well. Oh nice, sure. So the next part I'm really waiting to see is the way you build your home. <laughs> you know, being into uh, health and wellness, it didn't sit well with me that you live in a cement house. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we make brick ovens out of cement and, and bricks. Right. So it's, it's so hot inside. And the air quality is also very important mm. uh, long term if you're staying mm -hmm. at place. So we decided to build our home with natural materials. Mm. Um, so the walls are made out of uh, compressed bricks, uh, mud bricks that we actually compressed here on site. Oh, you got them made here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. And okay. Then, uh, the plastering is uh, limestone. Mm. And uh, the way we've done it is uh, the, the, the very high ceilings, mm. so the warm air goes up and then it comes out uh, just from the breeze, it gets taken out of the house. Okay. So they're naturally cool. Actually, it's uh, seven or eight degrees cooler in, the, in these homes than in the, in the houses in the city. So I'm actually, sure. Even, even in the winter, you need like heavy coats. Really? And we don't need air conditioning. Uh, it's, and even in the summer, it's it's right. really fine to live in and, uh, and, the, and the smell, the quality and the walls are breathing because they're mm. not bricks. Right. So they're, they're semi-porous. Uh, Porous. So there's a circulation of air yeah, that's happening. Air. And the flooring is uh, the natural tandoor. Uh, Let's go see. <laughs> Before we talk about it, I'm so curious to go see. Buy some of the best papaya trees ever. Which one? This, this one. one. <laughs> oh, it is uh, seedless. But okay. It's the sweetest yes. of my sister. <laughs> it's, it's huge. huge. Have, it's huge, yeah. And it's still growing, you know. It's just right. uh, it's a massive tree. <laughs> Strong guy. Yeah, started all the way from here, so the new branches are just about coming out. So Kavita is a big fan of flowers and uh, I thought I would be relieved of the responsibility for getting her flowers if I just got her a flower garden instead. <laughs> so oh, this, this is, is the this is the this is the perfume garden that's just outside our bedroom window. Oh wow. And you literally have to smell your way through it because these are all like very beautiful and this is the, the right time of the evening, just okay. at sunset is when the, the, the smells come out. This? Yeah, slow. Oh fragrance. my god, yes. <laughs> now they're intense. Uh, yeah. And then that's the uh, something over there which has a completely different flavor. It's just okay. beautiful. So Kavita, were you always such a good cook? I mean, good cook means not just good, but then cooking, keeping all the nutrition intact. So honestly, um, I really think the produce from this farm is what inspired my journey. Um, and I still find it quite astonishing when I look back at some of the recipes that I came and wonder back, you know, how did that come? Was it always in you? Uh, but really the moment Shilpa I still remember was uh, we had done our first crop of beetroot. They were beautiful big red beetroots mm. um, and as you know we do the farmers market twice right. a week at uh, Sage so all the vegetables go in from uh, here. That's on Tuesdays? Every Wednesday, oh, and, Wednesday Saturday. and Saturday. Yeah, so farmers the fresh market. vegetables get picked from here, brought there, we work with a bunch of other farmers and bring it in okay. and I knew how hard we had worked on this uh, uh, produce and uh, I walked back after all the vegetables had uh, all the baskets had gone out to the customers I walked into the cold storage to see one huge basket of beetroots left and it literally broke my heart oh. uh, the thought that they wouldn't actually have their uh, moment in somebody's table was very very depressing and all these foods have you know maybe a beetroot could survive a week you know mm -hmm. 10 days but right. most of the vegetables perish within four to five days right. so you have to make sure something is done to them and that you know they're somehow productively utilized yeah. for all the effort and energy that's Absolutely. gone into them and so a lot of the recipes actually just came from there mm. because I actually my first two ingredients along with the beetroot was gogura <laughs> and so the first dish that I made was actually a beetroot and gogura soup and I must stop you here because when I had the salad at uh, Sage many years back I have not seen anyone use gongura like the way you used it and I was like wow I didn't know it could be you know used in such uh, 
contemporary food as well. Yeah, <laughs> and actually, uh, you know, I mean, there's Asian food that uses gogra a lot. They okay. use the greens in oh. their uh, stir fries, etc. And you know, we just for us, gogra has never been elevated into mm. um, uh, any kind of kind of cuisine. And right. for me, it was really important that we were working with what was local and was just in abundance mm. and uh, really. Um, uh, so we then did a broth with it, which is beautiful with a little bit of ginger. So it's just wow. that natural flavor. We always chase after the lemon, which are obviously stunning and have mm, a complexity. Mm, mm. But uh, gungra can add so mm. much to your right. food without actually uh, going all the way there. So it was really all of Sage Farm's menu. Mm. Uh, the credit really goes to the uh, baby elephant farm. Uh, just looking at that produce, understanding where it came from and just right. knowing that it needed to be used in in effective ways was really how the food philosophy started and i really you know love the fact when we came to your place you were the one who was coming and that culture is not there in india i was like wow that is like passion to another level <laughs> i know it's been my baby for so long so uh, whenever my uh, kids feel they're not being tended to they always understand that they have another sibling in the form of sage <laughs> who always takes uh, attention away from them and i'm very excited to share that uh, my newest baby is called sava um, I wonder, is that yes. your expansion plan? That's oh, right. Please yeah. share those with us. Um, there's a wonderful lady called Miss Kathiwara who's actually from the fashion and uh, right. art uh, scene, and uh, she had this beautiful store called Melange, which was actually uh, it's a very, in all the designers it's been there of the for last many years. 27 years. So uh, she uh -huh. is journeying into health and wellness, and wonderful. I'm privileged to actually partner with her. Uh, so we're taking the melange space and turning it into a wholesome food museum of sorts where uh, a lot of the ethos of uh, the food at Sage will be um, uh, promoted there as well, connecting wow. people to uh, farmers and genuinely understanding local produce. Um, we are so proud of you really. <laughs> <laughs> You're going pan India and that's wonderful. Now that to a city like Bombay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you. All of your wishes as I've had them here uh, <laughs> to do well there. So it's so. like the latest, like the newest project. It is the newest project. Okay. So we're just, we just about in the process of opening doors uh, as we speak. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> so uh, we start with the uh, event tomorrow. We have a sound healing session happening. It's, it's a stunning place. It's a mm -hmm. cellar. Uh, so it lends itself very naturally to stuff that I love to do, which is fermenting mm. um, and because it is a wine cellar actually. So okay. we're actually going back to the ages and uh, the entire store is going to be filled with kombucha jars and wow. uh, natural pickles <laughs> and all of those and really get people to think back to preservation and conservation right. and really mm. extending and saving uh, season produce. Wonderful. This is so exciting, really. <laughs> and a little more about your house. I don't think we got to speak uh, about it. I want to also see the kind of tiles that you used for your, you know, your home. Yeah, we'll uh, walk in a little bit, and okay. then you can see some of the. So the fun thing about these walls is because they are limestone, they change colour through the year. Ah, okay. um, and they were coated with jaggery, so some bits are a little brown as they get exposed to the sun, uh, they start to change colour. So you can see a lot of the pattern out here. So why um, jaggery? Uh, jaggery is a sealing as well as uh, um, a cooling also and antibiotic uh, in general for the Wow! For the when mixed with limestone. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I yeah. thought jaggery is only for sweet <laughs> <laughs> and Very <laughs> traditional. <laughs> yeah, we did have uh, issues with ants but no, the limestone keeps that, uh, keeps that out. Okay. So, so <laughs> yeah, please. So we used all natural materials across the entire house. Yeah, let them um, come inside now. <laughs> you can see the tandoor oh. flooring here. So yeah, so all the hot air just escapes from the vents up there. Yeah. yeah. I love this hand loom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to repurpose uh, sarees into uh, Oh, so you yeah, uh, yeah, upcycle actually, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> So Tandur is a natural flooring from, uh, it's very local from Tandur. Tandur uh, flooring. And the, the tiles are uh, the Mangalore tiles Gloss. from Kerala. So 
These are the and tiles we'll actually have to see from inside. So there's actually two layers. Okay. Uh, so you'll see on the outside, it's a different pattern and the inside is different. Different pattern. Um, so there's two uh, tiles that actually sit on top of each other and that it also ha acts as an insulator. So a lot of the heat okay. actually gets trapped between them. Trapped. Trapped. Yeah. Between them. Trapped. Between yeah. Them. So okay. which again through? keeps uh, uh, the rooms a lot cooler. And the moment we walked in, there's, there was a sudden drop of temperature as if yeah. the are on, but then I don't see a single <laughs> no. No, that is wow. actually eventually, if ever we needed it, we set it up, but we've never had a need to <laughs> for it. Actually, uh, air conditioning on. Oh, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Like, I don't know why we don't, you know, like put this out there, and then most of more, most of us should be doing this. You yeah. know, given the fact that we live in a tropical country. Yeah. Yeah. conclude by asking you um, how can every home become sustainable not entirely like the way you you guys do it here but three most important things that everyone should adopt to kind of you know uh, have a zero wastage or uh, any three important things I think the first thing I would say is uh, don't aim too high Okay. When people, the zero waste is as, as encouraging as it is also discouraging to start off because mm. to think about getting rid of everything that you have in your right. household is very challenging. It's also expensive. Mm. Uh, you know, you can change everything to glass, but you have little kids running around the house, the glass breaks, there's issues that can happen. Right. Um, so the first thing I say to people is you've got to, between reduce, reuse and recycle, mm. reduce is absolutely the biggest key. Okay. You have got to reduce your com consumption of single-use plastic. Mm. That is an absolute must. Right. That's the mm. easiest one to do. Everybody should aim for that. Mm -hmm. uh, reduce the amount of clothing that you purchase. Mm. Make sure that clothing is not a waste that people talk enough about, but mm. it's a huge crisis. It is. Uh, the amount of water being used, the amount of the piles of clothes being thrown away uh, right. because of the fast fashion. Um, so reduce what you are consuming, whether it is food, mm -hmm. cook as much as your household needs. If it's a little less, that's perfectly okay. You know, we're all promoting intermittent fasting, but <laughs> yeah. we, we have a problem with the fact that we cooked a little too much. Everybody wants to make sure there was enough and left over. Mm -hmm. Reduce it a little bit. Let it just be enough for the family to actually have. So more than three things, I'd say just focus on one thing at every mm. aspect of your life. Mm. Uh, look at how you can reduce consumption okay. and suddenly the level of satisfaction increases your ability to move to the next step of recycling, reusing, uh, becomes food much food. more, everything mm. just comes as a result of that. So oh, mm. just I think aim for reduction and everything else will sort of follow mm. through that's, from there. You're mm. so right about it. You know, people get scared and stressed out when you talk yeah. about sustainability. It should be gratifying but not uh, stressful. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and honestly, everyone can make a difference. There's a lot of rhetoric out there which says, uh, you know, what's the point when you're sitting in your air conditioning house? It's true. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not having enough of an impact, but that small step that you take today will become something big tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's just a journey that you should just start and take on mm -hmm. as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. Wow. Look, and uh, from a health standpoint, I would say you know, prevention is a lot better than cure. Absolutely. <laughs> so just because you grew up eating three meals a day doesn't mean that's appropriate beyond the age of 35. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the third meal literally that uh, that gets you in the end. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big supporter and fan of intermittent fasting. It's a very traditional Indian concept. Correct. Uh, I fast 16 hours a day, so I only eat between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Okay. And uh, it's made a tremendous difference to my health. Uh, and I strongly encourage people to take that up. You know, there is really no need for the third meal beyond right. beyond the age of 35. 
Yeah, even yeah. in our culture, it was never like a dinner, like yeah. the one we eat at eight or seven. It's always yeah. been two meals. Yeah. Right. But then, lunch, dinner, breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Before you go to the farm and after you come back to the farm, those That's are literally exactly. the only two you meals. Even I remember that you can my have. father doing that. He would leave home, <laughs> you know, having a full meal, and he would come back in the evening and have his second meal. That's yes. all. That's yeah. It. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> lovely. It was such a beautiful experience, and thank you. For letting us, you know, explore your farm, and I hope I, I didn't intrude into your private spaces, <laughs> but it was such a learning experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for you, uh, sharing your day with us. Pleasure. <laughs> 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 hope you all loved what we explored today with Ravi and Kavita. Stay tuned for more updates. Subscribe to my channel. See you all next week.